الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى as you've heard the lecture today is going to be about physical fitness but before I start talking about the topic what I want to say to each and every one of you is our Sharia, our religion has not left a matter except it has explained it to us whether that matter is going to bring us good it told us about it and if that matter is going to bring us harm and problems it warned us against it وَلِذَلِكَ the scholars they said that the religion is صَالِحَةٌ لِكُلِّ زَمَانٍ وَمَكَانٍ This religion, it's befitting for every time and every place. And, be, be, and because we have become distanced from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, we sometimes thought, or sometimes we think, that the Qur'an doesn't have a response to this issue. It doesn't maybe have an answer for this issue. Or the Sunnah doesn't have an answer for this issue. But the true reality is, our religion does. And today, inshallah ta'ala, from nowhere else except the Qur'an and the Sunnah, I will show you how our religion spoke about physical, physical fitness from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And then, inshallah ta'ala, I will open the floor for any questions that you might have. If you look at physical fitness, it stands on four pillars. Anyone who wants to be physically fit, Four things have to be in place. Four things have to be intact. The first one is Al Akl, the eating and the drinking. Al Akl was Shurb. Your eating and your, your drinking. We'll speak about that. If you want to be physically fit, your eating and your drinking has to be what? Has to be good. And we'll speak about how the Quran and the Sunnah spoke about this issue. The second pillar in which it stands on is a gnome sleeping if you want to be physically fit you're sleeping and matters regarding that you have to give a lot of consideration to we'll speak about the manners and the etiquettes of sleeping third one is a nadafa cleansiness to be clean it plays a great role in the person's fitness and their health we'll speak about that and what the Quran and the Sunnah said about it. And the fourth one is Ar-Riyadah, which is workout. Going to the gym and working out and doing physical workout. What does the Sharia ah say regarding that? And has it spoken about it? Before I move on, do you all agree that the pillars of fit, fitness, physical fitness, it stands on those four pillars? Do we all agree? Is there anything you would add to those four? Let's start with the first one, inshallah ta'ala. Eating and drinking. Before I go into eating and drinking, what we have to know is sports. Shar'an, they are permissible except if there comes an evidence that says it's haram. Are we all together? Unless there is in that sports something that the Sharia prohibited and didn't allow the asal, the default position is that the fitness and the sport is permissible. If they connect to that sport, something that's haram, which we'll discuss later when we speak about sports and the fitness or the workout. But the asal is what? Permissibility. Let's start with the first one, which is al-aklu, eating, was shurb and drinking. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah 88, Allah says, وَكُلُوا eat, مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ Eat what Allah has provided you with. Halalan طَيِّبًا Underline that point for me. Allah Azza wa Jalla, what did he say? Eat from the provision and the rizq Allah has given you, that which is what? Halal. So the person who wants to work out, what type of food does that person need to eat? That which is 
that which is halal, number one. That's the first point that we take from in terms of eating. Also, if that food that you're eating is halal, can you over exaggerate in eating it or can you eat so much? Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala He says in Surah Al A'raf Ayah 31, Allah says, Wakulu wa sharabu, eat and drink. Wala tusrifu, don't go overboard. Don't eat too much and don't drink too much. Innahu la yuhibbul musrifin. Allah does not like those who exaggerate. We've taken two benefits now. The food and the drink that you're taking in, the substance that's going in, number one, it has to be what? Halal. And number two, you're not allowed to do israf. Israf is what concerns us now, which is what? Going overboard in your eating. Why? Because it harms your fitness. It harms your physical ability. So you're not allowed to overeat. Allah commanded us in this ayah and He instructed us to stay away from eating exagger- excessively. Allah says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا And then Allah says, إِنَّهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ إِنَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah does not like those who exaggerate in their eating and drinking. We're now going to move on to the second pillar. Before we move on to the second pillar, we've understood the Sharia commanded us to eat halal and to drink what? Halal. And it also commanded us to what? To not exaggerate in that which we eat or, or drink. Pay attention. The first one, what does it harm? The one that if you eat haram, what does it harm? It harms your deen. It harms your religion. It becomes an obstacle from your dua being accepted. The Prophet ﷺ told us in the hadith, A man, rajulun yutilu safar, a man who's going to travel, or a man who was traveling. Ash'atha agbar. This man was a traveler and he was dusted and etc. Ash'atha agbar. Yamuddu yadayhi ila sama. This man raised his hand and he said, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, my Lord, my Lord, he's in a time of hardship. He's calling on to his Lord and he says, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, my Lord. And then Allah tells us, or the Prophet ﷺ tells us, رَجُلُ يُطِيلُ السَّفَرْ أَشْعَثَ أَغْبَرْ يَمُدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ يَا رَبْ يَا رَبْ وَمَطْعَمُهُ حَرَامٌ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامٌ وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامٌ فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لِهَذَا This man, his food is haram. His drinking is haram. He was nurtured upon haram. How is Allah going to accept his dua? You're asking Allah to look after your physical health for you and to protect your health for you. But would he accept that dua from you if you've eaten haram, you've drinking haram, you are raising yourself upon haram. The second one is israf, which is to go overboard in the eating and the drinking. The Prophet ﷺ, what did he tell, tell us? That the stomach is divided into how much? Three. What's the first portion? Drinking. Second is for what? Water. And the third is for what? Air. Thuluthu li ta'amihi wa thuluthu li sharabihi. One third is for what? air for you to breathe. The second is what? Your food and your drinking. Imagine you make it all food and drink and you leave nothing for breathing. You can see that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam here, he's teaching us the manners of how to deal with the food. The second is your sleeping. Before I go into sleeping again, if you go to the gym, and those of you who who go to the gym and work out, you will realize that if you discuss with your personal instructor, he will tell you that it's vital that you observe your diet. Many people, they go to the gym and they eat everything. Eating everything works against your what? It goes and works, it works against your gym. Rather, I read an article before I came to this lecture. 67% of people's working out of your gym, it has to do with your diet. It's what you eat. Are you eating the right vegetables? Are you eating the right substance? So you can spend, you can do i'tikaf if you want, in the gym. And stay in the gym as long as you wish. If your diet at home is not good, what are you doing? Whatever you have built, you're, you're what? 
you're working against it. When is your body going to reach its pinnacle and when is it going to be strong? If you're building it and then next day you're eating a uh, 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 chicken burger or from Hardee's or McDonald's, you're working against the body. Number two is unknown sleeping. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells us in the Quran, Wahua Ledi Allah is the one. الَّذِي جَعَلَ the one who made for you اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا Please underline this point. Allah made the night a clothing. He made it dark. The reason why the night is dark is for what? It's for you to sleep. The night is for sleeping. وَالنَّوْمَ سُبَاتًا Allah made the daytime for you to go out and work and make your provision. Are we all together? Allah made the night for you to sleep and for you to go to bed. And the daytime Allah made it, وَجَعَلَ النَّهَارَ نُشُورًا And the daytime Allah made you go out, find your provision, look for your rizq. Some people what they did is they turned it upside down. And so they made their day the sleeping. And the night what did they do? They are awake. This goes against Sunan al the way Allah wa Taala set for us. And the way that it should be. Well, scientists, doctors have said that sleeping four hours a night is better than sleeping eight hours daytime. Four hours that you sleep at night, it's better than sleeping eight hours, what? At daytime. And this is la shaka, we have it in our Quran. We're not taking it from scientists merely, but it's actually backed up by what? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's speech. Allah says, وَجْعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subatan." We've made your night sleeping. There are manners when it comes to sleeping. There are etiquettes that we need to observe when it comes to sleeping. I'm going to mention them. Number one, if you want to be healthy, if you want to really sleep, follow these practical steps. Number one, إِغْلَاقُ الْأَبْوَابِ عِنْدَ إِقْبَالِ اللَّيْلِ When the night is about to come, lock your doors and close your doors. This is a sunnah from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا كَانَ جُنْحُ اللَّيْلِ If the night comes, فَكُفُّوا صِبْيَانَكُمْ If your children are playing outside, bring them in. Don't let them go outside at night time. Why? فَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ تَنْتَشِرْ The shaytan is spread on the earth now. Your children are going to be affected by this. So if your children are outside and they're playing, bring them in. Lock your doors and your house and the windows. Remember the word abwab in the Arabic language, it involves the what? The windows as well. It's not just the doors. فَإِذَا ذَهَبَتْ سَاعَةٌ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَخُلُّوهُ مَا فَخَلُّوهُمْ وَأَغْلِقُوا الْأَبْوَابَ وَاذْكُرُ اسْمُ اللَّهِ And mention the name of Allah. فَإِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ, فإن الشياطين Because the shayateen... لا يفتح بابا مغلقا. So when you lock the door, you say Bismillah. Shaytan will never open a locked door. But if a door is open, a house is open, what would it do? It will come in. So that's the first manners when it comes to sleeping. The second one is al witr qabl al nawm. Before you go to sleep, read your witr. I'm going to pray your salat al witr. Abu Huraira he said in the hadith Al Imam al Bukhari narrated in his Sahih. He said, Oh, Sani Khalili, my Khalil, my close friend advised me. Who is he referring to? The messenger. He said, He advised me بثلاثة, He advised me three things. صيام ثلاثة أيام من كل شهر. Every month, fast three days. The three days in every month, he advised me fast. وَرَكْعَةَيِ الضُّحَى And he commanded me, or he advised me to pray the duha. وَأَنْ أُوْتِرَ قَبْلَ أَنْ أَنَامْ And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he advised me to do witr before I go to sleep. The third is al-qira'ah, to read, ومسح, and to wipe on your body the Qur'an that you've read on it. You read Qur'an on your hands, and then you wipe it on yourself as much as you can read, reach on your body. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان إذا أوى إلى فراشه كل ليلة 
the messenger every night when he would go to his bed, jama'a kaffayhi, he would bring his two palms together. Thumma nafasa, and then he would blow inside it, in both of his hands. And then he would read, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ And he would read, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ ثُمَّ يَمْسَحُ بِهِ مَا And then with his hands, he would wipe over his whole entire body, مَسْتَطَاعَ مِنْ جَسَدِي However parts he can reach. There are parts of your body that you can't reach. بِهِ مَا عَلَى رَأْسِي وَوَجْهِ His face, his hands, his everywhere. وَمَا أَقْبَلَ مِنْ جَسَدِي يَفْعَلُ ذَلِكَ ثَلَاثَ مَرَّاتِ He would do that three times, صلى الله عليه وسلم. Narrations mention that when the messenger became sick, Aisha said, I used to read on him. And this is something that the wife and the husband, they help each other on. That the husband reads on his wife if she's sick and she can't do it, he does it for her. And the wife, she does it for her husband if he's sick and he's unable to do it, that she blows into her, into her hands and she reads, it on, she reads it onto him or she wipes it on his body. Number four, recite Al-Baqara Qabla al That the person recites Surah Al-Baqara before they go to sleep. Abi Mas'ud al-Badri radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger, Al-Ayatani, the two verses, min akhir Surah Al-Baqara, which is the ending of Surah Al-Baqara, man qara'ahuma, anyone who reads them, fi laylatin, in one night, kafatahu, it will provide, it will suffice him. The last two verses, in Surah Al-Baqara, anyone who reads it at night, kafatahu, it will suffice him. The fifth step that the person needs to do is an-nawmu ala al-wudu'i wa dhikr Sleep upon wudu. Make sure that you have wudu when you go to sleep. And make sure that you do dhikr before you go to sleep. Al-Bara ibn Azim radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, إِذَا أَتَيْتَ مَضْجِعَكَ If you come to your bed, فَتَوَضَّأْ wudu'aka. Do the wudu that you do for praying. When you want to go to your bed, do a complete wudu, the one that you do when you want to pray salah. Wudu'aka li salah. Thumma adji' ala shiqqika al-ayman and then sleep on your right side. Thumma qul and then say, Allahumma aslam tu wajhi ilayk. Oh Allah, I have faced towards you. Wa fawwadtu amri ilayk. And I have presented my affairs to you. Meaning I have placed my affairs in your hands. Wa alja'tu dhahari ilayk. And I've made my back face. رَغْبَةً وَرَهْبَةً إِلَيْكَ Oh Allah, I hope from you and I fear you. لَا مَلْجَ وَلَا مَنْجَ إِلَّا إِلَيْكَ There's nowhere to run and there's no one to find shelter from except you, O oh Allah. This is what the person does when they go to their bed. Allahumma, O oh Allah, آمَنْتُ I have believed in بِكِتَابِكَ الَّذِي أَنزَلْتَ I have believed in the book you've sent. وَبِنَبِيِّكَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلْتَ And the Prophet that you sent, I believe in him. The Prophet said, فَإِنْ مُتَّ بَرَاء ibn Azim, If you die that night when you say that, مِتَّ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ You die upon the fitrah. You are upon the correct way. And then look what he said to him, وَجْعَلْهُنَّ Make this آخِرَ مَا تَتَكَلَّمُ بِهِ Make this the last thing that you say. Don't do anything after this. Once you've said this, don't talk to anybody. Make this the last thing that you do. Imagine those who go to sleep on Instagram or Facebook or on their Twitter and they go to sleep and they have the phone in their hand. This is adab and manners that you need to follow. Because people don't follow these steps, when they become sick and they get possessed and then ayn happens to them, then they say, how has this happened to me? These are practical steps that you need to follow. And there are many other things that a person needs to do before he goes to sleep. What are the benefits for sleeping? What are the physical benefits that a person gets from sleeping? Number one, it brings about for you sleeping strength. You get physical strength from sleeping. If a person doesn't sleep for a period of time, they can't do anything. They become tired, they sit down and they can't move. You can be the most energetic person you want. If you haven't slept for a great period of time, what happens to you? 
you can't, you sit down and you're, you're the most quiet person in the room. And before you were what? You were doing back flips in the room, huh? You were jumping around. But now you're unable to do anything. You're physically fatigued, you're tired. The second benefit that it has is tanshiqu dhakira. If you haven't slept for a period of time, you receive memory loss. You don't remember things. وَلِذَلِكَ الْعَلَّامَ بِنُ الْقَيْمَ is a kitab called طِبُّ النَّبَوِي The prophetic medicine. One of the things that helps a person's memorization sharp, he mentions is what? Sleeping at night. Sleeping at night is what helps you memorize. وَلِذَلِكَ What you do all day, your brain registers it at night. What does it do? It starts storing things for you. So your memory is becoming strong. Also, Things that we need to do if we want to go to sleep. A lot of people say, I want to sleep, but I can't. Stay away from drinking tea or coffee before you go to sleep. Don't have a cup of tea and then say, I can't sleep. Or you have Pepsi and you say, I can't go to sleep. What do you do? Stay away from tea, coffee, anything that has caffeine in it. Pepsi. Should we add Mountain Dew to the list? Or should we, you can, I don't know, Mountain Dew is an exception. So, Stay away from all of those fizzy drinks. Second one is, which is something you should stay away from Aslan anyways, is those who smoke, they have problems with their sleeping. It causes, causes you what? Problems in your sleeping. Also, stay away from eating heavy food two hours before you want to go to sleep. Two hours before you want to go to sleep, stay away from any heavy meal. If you want to have something very light, that's something. Stay away from heavy food. Also, don't sleep with an empty stomach because you're going to keep waking up. Stay away from what? al hunger. Because every time you're going to stand up, look into the fridge. Huh? So stay away from an empty stomach. Also, if you want to have a good sleep at night, don't sleep a lot at daytime. The best sleeping, brothers, is and I would advise you all, is if your time, for, your hours of working allows you, is you sleep between Dhuhr and Asr, Qaylula. And you don't sleep any other time in between. At night time after you pray Isha, you sleep. And you wake up for Fajr. And you wake up for what? Fajr, one hour before Fajr, if you can wake up, or two hours before Fajr, you recite the Qur'an, this is the best time to memorize whatever you want to memorize. You're fresh, had a good sleep, you're not hungry, you're not sick from the food that you ate the night before. This is what? It's a healthy, healthy diet. The third thing is an nawafa the third one is an nadafa to be clean, cleansiness. This is the third pillar. How many pillars did we say? Four pillars. What was the first pillar that we spoke about? Eating and? Eating and drinking is very vital. The second one, what, what, when we spoke about eating and drinking, what did we say? You have to stay away from two things. What were they? Eating haram. And the second one is what? Going excessive. Exaggeration in what you eat or? Or drink. The second one was what? Sleeping, and we spoke about how many points or manners that we need to follow before we sleep. I mentioned five points. Now we're going to go into the third pillar for a f- good, healthy life is an nabafa to be clean. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the ayah, La taqum fihi abada. Muhammad, don't go to that masjid. There was a masjid that was built, that the hypocrites built in Medina to divide the Muslims. Allah commanded the messenger. It was called Masjid al-Dirar. Allah said, لا تقوم فيه أبدا. Don't ever stand in that masjid and go to it. لا مسجد أسس على التقوى A masjid that was built upon piety, which is the one he had. من أول يوم from the first day أحق أن تقوم فيه This one is the one that you should stand in. This is the masjid that you should be in. Not a masjid that was built upon what? It was called, the whole purpose for this masjid was built to divide the people or to cause harm. 
Allah then says, فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَنْ يَتَطَهَارُوا In there, there are men, and women are in there as well, who want to cleanse and who are pure, clean. And then Allah says after that, وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَّهِرِينَ Allah loves those who are pure and clean. So what did Allah praise those peer companions who are in the masjid? Masjid al-Ussisa ala taqwa, the masjid that was built upon piety. What was the characteristics Allah mentioned for them? Cleansiness and purity and how clean they were. And then tahara is very important. وَلِذَلِكَ the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم حديث جابر رضي الله تعالى عنهما he says, Jabir, Atana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The messenger came to us one day. Fara'a rajulan, the Prophet saw a man whose hair was scuffy. It was standing up. It wasn't in a good shape. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw him and then he looked at him and he said, Ama kana yajidu, can this man not find a comb to comb his hair? Can he not comb his hair down? Are we all together, brothers? And also the Prophet wasallam, he saw another man and he had garment and it had so much dirt on it. And it had so much what? Dirt on it. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ama, as for this one, could he not find ma water yaghsilu bihi thawbah that he, clo- he washes his clothing with? Could he not find water? Our religion is based upon cleansiness. At-tahuru shatru al-iman. Purity and cleansiness is what? Half of Iman. The person has to be what? وَلِذَلِكَ When the messenger was told to give da'wah, what did Allah say to him? قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ وَرَبَّكَ فَكَبِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِّرْ وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِّرْ Cleanse your clothing, Muhammad. If you want to give da'wah, don't be a person who gives da'wah and he has what? Because that would make people not want to take knowledge from you. And that would take away from you what? So be clean. Are we all together brothers? Also, وَثِيَابَكَ فَطَهِرْ There's another view that says, وَثِيَابَكَ here means what? أَيْ وَقَلْبَكَ فَطَهِرْ Purify your heart. So what is important brothers is, the cleansiness of the heart and the cleansiness of the... To be fit, you need both of them. What do you need to have? Taharatul al-qalb and taharatul al-badan. Are we all together brothers? Your heart has to be clean. And so does your clothes. What benefit does it hold brothers? That if your clothing is clean and you have a white garment, so crisp, it is white, there's no taint or there's no filth on it. But your heart is black and it's dark. You disbelieve or you're arrogant or you have bad traits in your heart. What benefit does it hold? Are we all together? So, the cleansiness of the heart is very important. The cleansiness of the body and the clothing doesn't entail arrogance. Some people think if a person wants to be clean and he wants to be beautiful and he wants to be sharp, that that means automatically he's what? He's arrogant. That's what they think and that's incorrect. That is what? It's actually incorrect. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبي مثقال حبة من كبر. The Prophet said he will not enter Jannah, the person who has a mustard seed of arrogance in his what? In his heart. Then a man, he said, يا رسول الله, O Messenger of Allah, إن الرجل يحب, a man loves his clothes to be clean. He likes his house and everything to be clean. He thought that was arrogance. And then the Messenger ﷺ, he said, Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal. Allah is beautiful and Allah loves beauty. Al-kibru batar al-haq wa ghamtu al-nas. What is arrogance? It's to dismiss the truth when it comes to you. And it's to belittle the people. That's arrogance. So having a cloth which is clean, what does it show? Inna Allah jameelun yuhibbu al-jamal. Allah is beautiful and he loves what? Pay attention to this. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi went a, fur, a step further when it come, came to cleansiness and the clothing. He Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَا عَلَىٰ أَحَدِكُمْ That one of you, in wajada, if he's able, and يَتَّخِذَ thawbain. If one of you, he can have two garments. The companions, remember, they, were, they didn't have much money. So the Messenger said to them, if, oh, 
If one of you can try to buy two garments, hell for what? Liyomil Jum'ah, one is for Friday, and the other one is for his work, his worldly. One is for Allah when you come in the masjid, you're clean. And the other one is for work when you're working. To be clean and to be how important it is in our religion. Walidalika, some people, alhamdulillah, they came into Islam when they saw that the Muslims, when they go to the call of nature and they do their call of nature, how they clean themselves and how they purify themselves, some people were like, wow. I remember a story. It's, a, it's something that happened to me. In college, I was studying business. I was studying business in college. And so they took us to the Coca-Cola that was situated in Edmonton. That's a place in London, north of London. So what I did was, we came, and when we came to the Coca-Cola, they were teaching us how Coca-Cola came about, and the history of Coca-Cola, and etc. So what happened was, um, I had to go to do the, my call of nature, so I wanted to go to the toilet. So when I went to the toilet, the guy who was doing the presentation for us, who was the branch manager, had to go to the toilet as well. We both had to go to the toilet. Qadarullah, we went, we went into the toilet at the same time, but two different toilets. Okay? And then we both came out, Qadarullah, at the same time. I went and I washed my hands in soap and clean. He just walked out. Are we all together? No, no, he was the head of the... He was the head of... The, uh, the department of cleanliness of Coca-Cola. He overlooks if they are following. The, that was his job. It wasn't the branch manager. The branch manager wasn't the one that was talking to us. Ajeeb. They're talking about cleanliness. You haven't even cle- washed your hands. وَلِذَلِكَ our messenger. Imagine this, brothers. He, him being a leader, a husband of nine wives, a father of many, had... Spoken to his companions when they go to the toilet, they have to use this much. They have to clean themselves with water. Are you with me, brothers? Well, the Jew man, when he came to Salman al Farisi, he said to him, he was shocked. He said, Inna Rasulakum, your prophet. He told you guys everything. And Salman al Farisi said, Yes. Hatta al Khira'a, when we go to the call of nature, he told us how to clean ourselves. Do you know what he said to us? Allah nestanjiya bi akalimi thalatati ahjar. He said, You can't use less than three rocks. He also told us, sallallahu alayhi wa that we clean ourselves with our left hand because we eat with our right hand. He told us, Allah nastaqbil al wa Allah nastadbiraha, that we don't face the qibla when we're doing our call of nature and that we don't turn our back towards the qibla. This shows you what? Islam is made for everybody's day to day life. This religion covers everything. It's shamil. Are we all together, brothers? The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sometimes he would come to the masjid and then he would see or he saw salah so once upon a time he came to the masjid and he saw a saliva stuck to the masjid and then the prophet rebuked his companions for this manner he said who did this this is not something that we have to tolerate and sallallahu alayhi wasallam also when jibril came to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam how was the appearance of jibril بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسٌ عِنْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ اِطَّلَعَ عَلَيْنَا رَجُلٌ شَدِيدُ بَيَاطِ الثِّيَابِ شَدِيدُ سَوَادِ الشَّعْرِ لَا يُرَى عَلَيْهِ أَثَرُ السَّفَرُ وَلَا يَعْرِفُهُ مِنَّا أَحَدٌ This man, he was what? Jibreel came in what form? Clean. His thobe was white. His hair was what? Black. No dirt. Because he was teaching them what? Their religion. He was teaching them, when you come as a student, don't come scruffy. Because at the ending of the hadith, what does he say? When the Prophet said to Umar radiallahu anhu, أَتَدْرِي مَنِ السَّائِلِ قُلْتُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُ عَالَمُ قَالَ فَإِنَّهُ جِبْرِيلٌ أَتَاكُمْ يُعَلِّمُكُمْ It's Jibreel who came to teach your religion. How to dress yourself, how to look, how clean that you should look. So, cleansiness is one of the vital relationship in our concept of fitness. We're now going to go into the last one, which is working out. Which is the last pillar when it comes to physical, physical what? Fitness. Al-Riyadha, to work out. Does Islam give importance to that? I advise you guys to read a kitab called Al-Furusiyatul Muhammadiyah by Ibn Al-Qayyim. It's called what? Furusiyatul Muhammadiyah. It's written by who? Ibn Al-Qayyim. 
he talks about archery, riding horse, sports. He wrote a whole book on that. And he also mentions in his six-volume book, Zad al-Mi'ad, he mentions inside a chapter where he talks about how the Prophet was in his physical training, how he was. What are the objectives of being physically, physically fit in the Sharia? What are the objectives? What are the maqasid? Number one, Islam as a religion, it wants to nurture strong, powerful people. The religion doesn't want weak people who are physically weak, who are mentally weak, who are spiritually weak. Walidalika, the person is a component of three things. And the religion works towards strengthening these three things. Body, mind, and soul. The body of the person, the mind, and the soul. And it's sad that you don't tend to find the Muslims working on each and every one of those three. I promise you, if you go home every day and you ask yourself, how much have I invested towards my body? And how much have I invested towards my mind? And how much have I invested towards my soul? Well, like every day, if you balance those, what will happen? You will live a very happy life. You, the way that the body becomes dehydrated, if you don't drink a lot of water, the soul becomes dehydrated if it doesn't get the amount of dhikr that it needs. Are you with me, brothers? That's why you find a person who's fit, who's got six packs everywhere, even on his ears. Yeah, he's, he's got six packs everywhere. Yeah, he doesn't like to cough in the gym. But Adalika, he wants to commit what? He wants to commit suicide. He's rich. He's got everything. Why do you want to? Because the soul has become dehydrated. He doesn't want to live anymore. He's depressed, anxiety. The reason is because. أَلَمْ يَأْنِنِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنْ تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ وَلَا يَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدُ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَكَثِيرٌ مِنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ He distanced himself from the remembrance of Allah, the Qur'an, and the heart needs the Qur'an. It needs it, it craves for it. Are you there brothers? It craves. You see a person coming to Islam and he's just crying as soon as he comes into Islam. When he says the shahada, why are you crying for? صح? The person hears the Qur'an and he just can't. The serenity, the beauty of the Qur'an. The, you start crying, you feel it. Why? It's because of the soul. So the religion wants to make you strong in all of those three departments. وَلِذَلِكَ Allah تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى He prays or He speaks about Himself. Allah speaks about Himself. And what attribute did He give Himself? Quwa. Allah says, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ هُوَ الْقَوِي Allah is one who is قَوِي and He is Al-Aziz أي الغالب في أمره Allah is قوي meaning he's strong. And Allah is also what? Al-Aziz. What does Aziz mean? Aziz is the one when he wants something, it will happen the way he wants it and no one can stop it. That's what Aziz means. Aziz means Al-Ghalibu fi Amrihi. We want something, it might happen or it might not. Allah wants it, it will happen. How he wants it, when he wants it, how? No one can stop it. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, when he speaks about those who spoke wrong about him, what did he say? Allah says, مَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ They did not honor Allah and they did not venerate Allah and glorify Allah the way He deserves. And then Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَقَوِيٌّ عَزِيزٌ Allah is strong and He's Aziz. So these characteristics of quwa is Allah's characteristics. Also Allah describes some of the angels as to be what? Especially Jibreel. What did Allah describe him to be? Qawi, strong. Look what He said. ذِي قُوَّةٍ Jibreel is what? One who has strength in the Arsh Makin. Allah also He praised some of the prophets with the characteristics of strength. What did He say? Ya Yahya, khudil kitaba bi quwa. Yahya, take the Quran with what? Strength. Allah also said about the believers, wa aiddu lahum mustatatum min quwa wa min ribat al khairi khayli turhibun bi adu Allah. Wa aiddu pepe. When you're fighting with the non-believers, prepare for them. Mastata'atu min quwa, with strength. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did he say? He said, Al-mu'minu al-qawi ahabbu ila Allahi min al-mu'minu al-da'if wa fi kullin khayr. Allah, he loves the believer who is what? First, he said, the hadith says, Al-mu'minu al-qawi, the believer who is strong is better than the one who is what? Weak. The strength here, what does it mean? 
It means all three that I mentioned, the three components of the person. Because the quwa here is unrestricted, so we have to leave it what? Unrestricted. Each and every one of them is talking about it. Because, think of this. If a person is stronger than you physically, he's going to do ibadat that you can't do. What is he going to pray at night? More qiyamul layl because he's physically strong. And you're what? You're weak, you're going to sleep. Are you there, brothers? So he's going to do more ibadat than you can do, so he's going to be better than you in that regard. Iman-wise, he's stronger than you. Are we all together, brothers? So it also involves the physical ability. Those who think that the physical ability is not referred to in the hadith is wrong. It means the physical ability and it means the what? The iman. Like in the iman is the asal. It doesn't matter if you're physically strong, but you don't have no strong iman. What really matters is what? Quwatul iman. Look at the physical ability, how the sharia observes it. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, he used to fast every day and he used to pray all night. What would, the make, what would that do to the person? Because he's not taking the what? The food and the drink that was needed. And he's also taken away from his what? And those are two components we mentioned for what? Ah. So the messenger, look what he said to him. The Prophet said to him, when he, Balagani, it reached me, katasom, that you fast, and nahara every day. And that all night that you're standing. That's what I heard. Is that true? Another benefit that we take from this. Brothers, if you hear a rumor of somebody, verify. Don't jump to it and say, this is what happened, this is what you did, and I, I know this happened. First of all, ask. This is a common practice of the Prophet ﷺ. He would always ask before he made the judgment. One day he came to the masjid, he saw a rope, and this rope was in the masjid, and the messenger said, whose rope is this? Whose rope was this? And what did they say to him? They said, it's your wife's rope. Zaynab bin Tijah, that's her rope. He said, what does she do? They said, Ya Rasulullah, she prays all night. And when her legs cannot carry her, she dangles off the rope. She wants to just pray. All night she's praying. And when her legs cannot carry her, she still doesn't want to stop. What does she want to do? That's a woman at the time of the Messenger of Wife of the Prophet ﷺ. The effort that she's exerting in wanting to pray. Now the Prophet knows what the rope is for. Are you there, brothers? This gives us also understanding how the companions were strong. Wallahi, how dedicated they were. Are you there, brothers? Some of them, do you know, do you know what they used to do? At night, they used to have a stick next to their, their bed. And they would pray and pray and pray. And then when their legs become weak, they take the stick and they hit their leg. And they say, stand up. You want to compete with Muhammad and his companions? To Jannah? And you want to get tired right now? Wallahi, there's no place for you. Their dedication and their effort. So Zainab Abi Tijash, when the Prophet found out what she does with the rope, what did he say? Hulu, take it down. Take it down. And then he said, whoever wants to pray, let him pray upon ability. And when he's tired, let him go to sleep. What do we take from this hadith? First of all, verifying. Finding out, investigating first. What's this rope for? Whose is it? What does she do with it? When he found out, then he gave the ruling. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The second thing is how important the religion gives what? Quwwatul badan. The observing of your physical ability. So when Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As said, Ya Rasulullah, it's true, I fast all day and all night I am praying. The messenger then said to him, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, فَلَا تَفْعَلْ Then don't do this. Why? He said, فَإِنَّ لِجَسَدِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَظَّى Your body has a right on you, portion. It's physical ability. Your body, what does it have? When you're eating the food the way that you're eating and you're just taking it in, you're forgetting what? That your body has what? Has rights on you. Your eyes have what? Rights on you. You have to sleep. Don't do this to yourself. And your wife has rights on you. Why are you doing this to her? All that night you're praying. You're not giving her any rights. The Prophet said, Sum, fast. And break your fast. Some days fast, some days don't fast. The religion of Islam, brothers, it's against the idea of going extreme in whatever you're doing. It falls under, وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْمُسْرِفِينَ Allah doesn't like those who go overboard. Also, 
the second objective, the second objective, a maqsad of working out, brothers, is what? It actually strengthens your mindset. Working out actually brings a characteristics of patience and forbearance. You become a person who's very tolerant. Naam. If you go to the gym and then you're picking up weight and they say, okay, you do nine and your arms are finished and you can't do, and they go, go, make that pushing, what does it bring about? Tolerance. Sometimes that one last one can be more harder for you than that. So it brings about, all these kalam I'm bringing from is Ibn Al-Qayyim. Ibn Al-Qayyim is not talking about weightlifting, of course. But he's talking about the concept of what? It brings about, he says, Yunam sabra It brings about patience. And it also even brings Al-Jur'a. The person becomes dedicated. Like, they become eager to do things. When you're working out at the beginning, that fear, it goes. You get rid of it. You overcome it. it that's the benefit that it brings. What are some of the examples of physical things that a person can do? Physical, I'm a workout that a person can do. Number one is sibaha, swimming, and rami, archery, rukub, riding horse. These are things that should be done. That Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, what did he say? وَأَعِدُّ لَهُمْ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةً أَلَا إِنَّ الْقُوَّةَ الرَّمِي The Prophet said that the strength is in what? Learning archery. ولذلك, if you look at the great scholars like Imam Shafi'i and Abu Hanifa and, and Imam Malik and others, you, learn, you look at their biography and you know what you read? They were good at archery. And Imam Shafi'i Mathana was said, if ten arrows were given, he would get nine accurate and he would miss one. That's how good he was. He would get nine precise. And he would miss the tenth one. That's how he was. Um, Al Imam uh, a Muslim narrated in his Sahih that the Prophet said, Man ta'allam al rami, anyone who learns archery, thumma tarakaw, and he leaves it, falaysa minna, he's not from amongst us. Al Imam Muslim narrated his, this in his what? In his Sahih. Anyone who learns archery, he is good at archery, and he leaves it, thumma tarakaw, falaysa minna, he's not from amongst us. What does it show you? The importance of physical ability. You see, from them is, the, is running and racing. And you all know the famous hadith of Prophet ﷺ. He was running and who was running with him? His wife. So this is not restricted to brothers only. This is also for what? For the women as well. وَمِنْهَا الْمُصَارَعَةِ Learning what? Wrestling. Wrestling is what? It's also... The Prophet ﷺ wrestled. Rakana ibn Yazid and the Prophet wrestled. Rakana ibn Yazid and the Messenger ﷺ they wrestled. Wrestling is what? It's very good. And there should be classes made for wrestling. It's good. Um, also, having animals race one another. This is also a sport that was present at whose time? The Messenger ﷺ. Alayhi salatu wassalam. Now I want to talk about some manners that need to be observed when it comes to sports in Islam and, pri- and principles and I'm going to conclude with that inshallah ta'ala. Islam brothers, la yardal islamu. Islam is not pleased with. Our religion, before I go into it, I just want to mention the best type of sport in our religion is four. The best four. Because of the hadith of the Prophet. The Prophet said, Kullu shayin, everything, laysa min dhikri lahi, that doesn't have the remembrance of Allah, is a what? Lahun wa la'ibun. In another riwayah, what does it say? It's batil. Everything that doesn't have the remembrance of Allah is what? Batil. The, but the batil here doesn't mean that it's haram. As Ibn Taymiyyah mentions in his kitab al istiqama and Al Imam uh, Muhammad ibn Ali Shawkari mentions in his kitab Nailu Awtar, he brings the kalam of Abi Hamid al Ghazali. That, it doesn't mean it's haram. It just means that it's makru, is disliked. But four are good. What are they? Mula'abatu rajuli imra'atahu, a man playing with his wife. Huh? Playing with your wife. Whether it be hide and seek. Playing with your, playing with your wife. Whatever game you like. Wata'deebu <laughs> rajuli farasahu. And a man nurturing his what? And training his what? His horse. 
Training your horse. It's a good sport. ومشي الرجل A man running بين الغرضين between two places. He's running. Huh? 100 meters or whatever. Running. Sprint. It's a good sport. وتعليم الرجل السباحة And a man learning what? And a man learning learning swimming. This hadith, some of the scholars, they differed on its authenticity. Lakin Bayhaqi and Mundiri narrated it, and Shaykh al-Albani authenticated it. And the truth is that the hadith is what? It is sahih. It's a what? Authentic hadith. Islam doesn't like when you're doing sports, you have to stay away from these things, and I'm going to conclude with it, inshaAllah ta'ala. The first one is, when you are doing sports, don't let whatever sports you're doing, or whatever fitness that you're doing, don't let it, that it takes you away from what? Your religious obligation. Some people, they are playing, huh? and Salah comes in and says, Akhi, look, let me just finish this. That's not permissible. Number two, لا يرضى, لا يرضى, the Sharia is not pleased أن نمارس الرياضة بشكل يؤذي الغير You can't do the sports if it's causing other people harm Some people they play football in the middle of the road or they're playing sports at a time when between Dhuhr and Asr where people are sleeping in the neighborhood There's a qaylula, some people are sleeping, they came from work your, your, is aj on them or you're playing in the courtyard and your, the ball is, th- is being thrown into the f- neighbor's house and it's causing what? Problem, the religion doesn't allow that. Number three, لا بالمنقوت, You're not allowed partinism. Partinism means, or my group against yours. And then based on that is wala wal-bar, love and hate. Are you there? Because this person is part of your group, you love them. And because that person is not on your side, on your group, you show hate and enmity. Are we all together? The religion is not for it. Where love and hate is based upon a group, this is, goes against our religion. Because all the believers are what? Believers. I mean, I remember a couple of years back, remember when Algeria and I think Egypt played football and then what they fought each other in the stadium. Are you there, brothers? People take this thing very serious. Wallahi, you see it in the UK. Football, sports, those who support football, some of them, they wake up Qiyamul Layl for the team. You know, they make dua for the team. Allah, you know, give them ta'eed. Allah, give them nusra, victory. They wake Qiyamul Layl. Not to mention the love and the passion, the love they have for this group. And the hate. I've seen brothers who stop talking to each other. Because football. They don't give each other salams at all. They're in the same house. Have you guys seen people like that? I've seen, wallahi, they don't give salams. This is, it doesn't go against, it goes against our religion. Also, sports that involves opposite genders. Where men and women are playing together. Our religion is not, it doesn't allow that. Also, um, the sports, it doesn't, or the fitness, it shouldn't have inside it any magic or spiritual things that are put towards it, meditation, like some sports. Does yoga fall under like that? <laughs> ah, so this, let's sp- speak about the spiritual one. It's not permissible. Or you go to a Wun Chung or Shaolin master and he, he tells you, huh? The Buddha master, he tells you, huh? In order to get this, there has to be a greater power. And he has to... All of this, layer Jews. You're allowed to do the, the kicking and the punching around. But you're, this meditation, <laughs> and this belief that there's a power and there's a strength and this... Which they believe. They believe. That when they take their stomach and they put this blade on it, they believe that there is a... Well, I shaka, they work with jinns. How they do things. They do push up with one finger. You can, there's no doubt there's a jinn lifting him up. Yeah. All of that is not permissible. Shara'an is not. It is not allowed. Um, and it goes against the concept of sports that we're talking about. Also, the person who's playing sports has to have the spirit and the, the, that if your team wins, alhamdulillah, no problem. 
If they lose, alhamdulillah. Some people, they lose. It's like, A'udhu Billah, it's your fault uh, because of you. And they can't take al ayamu duwal. The days they go around and they evolve. You see, wa tilka al-ayamu, wa tilka al-ayamu nudawiluha bayna al-nas. Today you take victory, at tomorrow day, having that spirit is important. And that is some of the points that I could come with on the very short notice I was given into preparing this lecture. Uh, those were points that I could come with. Anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and shaitan, and Allah and his messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayh. Any questions? I'm going to start from the right side, eh? Mm. Mm. You see, the difference between people is sleeping it differs from one person to another. Some pers- uh, one p- a particular person he can sleep for four hours and that's more than enough for him. And there's somebody who can't sleep for four hours. He can sleep for how much? Eight hours. Eight hours is average. That's, that's what everybody should be. Eight hours is normal. If Allah did not create you that way, don't beat yourself for it. But you're not four hours. Or five hours. Are you with me, brothers? They slept for that much and they were able to work. I personally believe you can train yourself to reduce your sleep. You can. You can what? You can train yourself. And the way that you do that is you take from your sleep a little bit, gradually, until you reach a point where you can sleep for four to five hours and you function fine, no problem. You function fine. But that four or five hours that we're, talk- we're talking about is at night time. You may get another two, two hours, two, three hours inside the day. And the best type of sleeping is if you divide your eight hours like that. Eight hours, even that though is what you should do, it shouldn't all be at what? All at once. It's not healthy. What is healthy is what? Put five or six hours here and then take the other, the three or two or four hours and put it here. Are we all together? So enough is subjective. Five hours maybe for somebody, another person eight hours. But anybody more than eight hours, that's a bit worrying. If you're sleeping more than eight hours, are you sleeping or are you dead? Yeah. Uh, Hold any sports that involves the face is not permissible. Islamically, you're not allowed to do a sports that it's what? You're attacking a person's face. Um, where you have to strike a person's face or do something, whether it be punching, whether it be sword, anything that's to do with the face is not shara'an permissible. But here's the question. What about if there's a guard on the face? What about if the person's wearing a gear? What is the ruling? That needs a... Dirasa, that needs a more observation. But what I know is that hadith that speak about your face, it means direct face. But if a person's wearing a gear that won't harm them necessarily, how would you, what would the, what's the ruling regarding that? That needs more observation, it needs more looking, inshallah ta'ala. Because some sports, the whole, imp- the whole objective behind it is to punch the person in the face. That's boxing, right? So if the whole objective is taken, can the person ever learn boxing? So um, that the face gear needs a uh, maybe a observation, and Allah knows best. Any other question? Fadl. You mentioned these four points, like uh, praying with your wife and sunni hours. Uh, in in these four cases, do we need the intention, like we are doing it for the sake of Allah, or we are gonna get like should we need the intention for the sake of Allah in this case, or like we have like no intention? Ah. No, it means that these five are not disliked. You don't get rewarded for it if you just do it. But if you want to get reward for it, and you're doing it because you want to get closer to Allah by doing this, then naam, you get ajr for it. For example, if a man, he, 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 he plays hide and seek with his wife, and he does it for Allah's sake, he wants to get closer to Allah by it, naam, he gets ajr for it. Okay? If he's not doing with any intention, that's not even... No, he misses the reward. Of course, la shak. Any husband who provides for his wife, he gives her clothing, 
he gives her a house. He pay, if he doesn't have the intention, he doesn't get rewarded for it. The Prophet Sallallahu told us in the hadith, حَتَّى مَا تَجْعَلُ فِي فَيِّ مرأتك, The spoon that you place in the wife's mouth, if you come with the intention, Allah, I'm getting closer to you. To you. This is what you commanded me. This is what a slave like me should do. Oh Allah. If you do that for that sake, what happens? Every single penny that you give your wife, what do you get for it? Reward. So shaitan will make you lose that reward. Every month you're sending bills and you're paying everything, but you're not coming with the intention, you're missing out. If only you just came with an intention, you get rewarded for it. Sah? I mean, definitely you have to buy air conditioner. <laughs> but um, opening the windows at night is what's been spoken about specifically, right? Shara'an is something that a person should. Especially at that time, if you know, imagine you knew an enemy is coming to invade your house at that time. Would you prefer to be hot inside the house? <laughs> or would you let the enemy come in? Uh, so this is the enemy. When he comes in, he's going to destroy your family, he's going to destroy your children, he's going to possess your wife. So you lock all, all of the doors. But some people, they say you have to cover the... Uh, 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 some of the narrations do come across covering whatever's... Not leaving things what? Uncovered. Uh, that had those narrations and stuff, they need a more observation, inshallah, more looking. But what we know is that lock the doors, the windows, everything, close it. Don't have anything open. And it's sad because, wallahi, if many of us just follow these instructions, these instructions, what would we have? A blessed lifestyle. Wallahi, you see a person coming into the door, he's talking on the phone and he's opening his door. Ah, wallahi, he's talking on the phone. And he know, yeah, you just brought a shaitan into your house. And then after that, guess what? The food is bought. You open, you eat. Hey, mashallah. Now he's going to eat with you. When he, and, he's, and at night, you just jumped in bed. He's got somewhere to sleep. So you gave him a house to sleep. You gave him food to eat. And then you gave him a bed to sleep on. Who's he going to use all of that energy that he gets? Who's he going to use it against? And then you come and you say, Shaykh, Wallah, I can't pray Qiyamul Layl. I can't fast in the month of Ramadan properly. Of course your shaitan is strong. He's got six packs. He's a, phys- physically, he's strong. Are you the Hakika, that's a reality. You've nurtured your shaitan. He's living a VIP. He's, he's living a VIP life. And so he's using every single energy he has against two. So weaken your shaitan. How do you weaken him? Don't let him come into a house. Don't let him have any place to sleep. Don't let him have any food to eat. Don't let him have any, what do you call it, uh, uh, bed to sleep on. Then inshallah ta'ala, you look, watch how your ibadah becomes. And your obedience of Allah becomes. You become very strong. Your iman becomes strong. Your lifestyle becomes strong. Even the relationship between you and your wife becomes strong. Sahih? Uh, we stop there, inshaAllah. Subhanakallah. Bihamdika. Shadu Allah. Ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruq. Atubu.